Hi everyone, how are you? Um, I am Cecilia Ricab. I am uh, IIPP, so the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose uh, Head of Research, and I'm also an Associate Professor in Economics here, and I want to welcome you all to this uh, book presentation, which actually will be the first one of four. Uh, this year, we are organizing a research seminar series that will broadcast prominent young scholars that are here to share with us how they have dealt with major uh, research questions that also have a lot of political and, and economic, social and ecological implications. So you don't need me to say that we are living under uh, multiple crises or uh, one crisis with multiple aspects at every single dimension of our life. We see this every day. And I think that to tackle them, we really need to be bold and ask ourselves questions that cannot be fitted into 10,000 words in an academic paper. This requires really to engage in larger conversations, not only in terms of the size of the research output, but also to speak to larger audiences. And this is why we are here to listen to Yostein today, because he has engaged in one of these conversations, precisely looking at uh, a topic that at the same time is something that is of the interest of a lot of scholars, but also should be at least of the interest of people in general. It directly deals not only with our future, but also with our present. So uh, it couldn't be a better first uh, book presentation for this series. As I said, we will have three other events. Uh, one will be hosted in March, then April and May, and we will also be, as in this case, uh, hosting an event that is a book presentation by a prominent young scholar. And on top of that, we will not only have Jostein presenting his book today, but we will also have two discussions. So let me go uh, straight to uh, our session today. Jostein uh, will be uh, presenting his book, and I, uh, you have some copies here if you want to have a look at it. Uh, it's um, The title of the book is, the I want to read it properly, The Future of the Factory, and um, and on top of him presenting the book, we will also listen to Lorenza and Pritish. And let me just briefly give you an overview of their positions, and then we are ready to start. So, uh, Jostein uh, Haugi, more or less, uh, he's an assistant professor in development studies at the University of Cambridge. And uh, his, uh, his book, The Future of the Factory, How Mega Trends Are Changing Industrialization, will be discussed by Lorenza Monaco. She is an associate and a research fellow in economics of innovation and industrial policy here at IAPP. And also uh, after her, it will be discussed by uh, British Beuria, who is associate professor at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. So basically how this will go, we will give uh, Jostein around 20, 25 minutes uh, to present his book and, and share the main ideas or whatever you want to share actually about your book with all of us. And then 10 minutes to Lorenza and 10 to British to uh, bring some questions, discuss the book. After that, uh, probably if you want, you can have like some minutes to reply, react to the comments, and then we will of course open the floor to all of you here and also to those online. So without further ado, thanks a lot, the three of you, especially Justin, for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, just practically, I had some slides prepared for this talk. Um, oh, I use a clicker here. so. Perfect. Okay. I hope that I managed to uh, talk to you and uh, maybe have eyes at the back of my head sometimes, but I also see a screen there. So um, I'm also in control over what you see here. But yeah, so first of all, thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for having me here and the whole uh, family of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, I want to say I'm very excited about today, not of course, to discuss my book with all of you, but because there are people here who know a lot about uh, some or many of the topics that I talk about in the book. The chair, Cecilia, and also British and Lorenza, they've all published things about the book, so we should all, uh, I'm excited for, for us to draw upon all of our experiences and uh, research on this, on this topic. So, this is the title of the book, The Future of the Factory, How Megatrends Are Changing uh, Industrialization. Now, uh, I want to ask you all, who knows who the man uh, being shot here is? 
Does someone have any idea? This is this is really to gauge how much you know about this topic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this Hamilton, perfect. Yeah, cookie to you. Um, so this is Alexander Hamilton. Maybe a, an unfortunate uh, photo because he's he's being killed here uh, in a duel with Aaron Burr. Um, but the reason I, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about Hamilton as a backdrop to this book. So Hamilton is considered one of the founding fathers of the United States, the very first Secretary of the Treasury, um, and really built a blocks of the U.S. Constitution. So he's a very important figure in U.S. history. Is that um, photograph, I mean, is that painting true? Did it actually happen? Oh, he was killed in a duel, yes. He was, yeah. Oh, I thought you would know, Robert, huh? <laughs> anyway. So um, I'm not going to talk about the duel, but he submitted or he wrote a wealth of reports that he submitted to U.S. Congress um, in his life. And one of them was called the report on the subject of manufacturers that he submitted to U.S. Congress in 1791. And in this report, he argued passionately that the U.S. needed to put effort into developing its manufacturing sector through industrial policy, through trade policy. Why? Well, because this was going to be the foundation of economic growth, prosperity, military might, international competitiveness, and so on. Hamilton saw that Great Britain was ahead of the United States in all these things, and he advised the US to try to catch up. Eventually, the US did. European countries also did catch up. and. We saw this term industrialized country uh, appear. And in many ways now, this idea of uh, being a developed country, in lack of a better term, uh, has also become synonymous with being an industrialized country. Uh, and this is also really fed into how we think about economic development and development economics. Industrialization, building up manufacturing capabilities has become seen core and central of economic growth and development. But now, a lot of things are happening in the world that has started making people question if industrialization will look the same, if actually industrialization um, feeds into economic development and growth the same way it used to did. Global shifts are being analyzed as to how manufacturing and the landscape of industrialization is changing. And that's really what this book is about. It's about analyzing, and I look at these four so-called megatrends for big global shifts, how this makes us have to rethink, or in some instances not rethink, industrialization trajectories around the world. So you'll see me arguing that yes, in some ways industrialization has changed, but in other ways it hasn't changed. In other ways we can still take lessons from the past, from Hamilton. Now before, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of each of the four megatrends. So I'm not going to talk, I think I'll, I'll talk for about 30 minutes or so, um, and I'll give you a few of the key arguments uh, of the book. But before I do that, just very quickly, the title, The Future of the Factory, this slide here is to give you an idea of the subject matter of the book and the subjects that I touch upon. If you came here and you wanted to learn something about organizational processes within the factory, I am sorry to disappoint you. Um, I know the title in that sense can be mis misleading. It's really a book within the spheres of international political economy and development economics. So these are the four megatrends that I focus on in the book. The first one is the rise of services as an alternative to manufacturing and achieving growth and prosperity. The second is about digital automation technologies. And I talk and I analyze, especially in the book, this idea that automation technologies have or might displace jobs in the manufacturing sector if this idea of labor-intensive industrialization is closed off to countries now because automation will take jobs. I look specifically at AI-related automation technologies. Then I look at globalization of production. I talk about the winners and losers in this age of globalized production. And I also address ecological breakdown, which I think is incredibly important when we talk about industrial development and industry. Given the toll on the environment that industrialization has taken historically, is it even feasible for those countries who haven't built up manufacturing capabilities to industrialize? All right. 
So I'll give you some of the key arguments of the book now and also how they relate to each of these megatrends. And the first argument is that traditional industrialization and factory-based production remains crucial for economic development and innovation. So in that sense, Hamilton's insights remain still very central for understanding economic growth, development, and prosperity today. One lens to look at this is through the rise of services, right? So there's evidence increasing. There are also arguments uh, put forth that countries can now rely on services instead of manufacturing to grow their economies. So there are a lot of good examples out there. India, for example, and I talk a lot about the productivity growth potential of non-manufacturing related services and that countries can tap into this opportunity now. But I still argue that all those services are increasingly an avenue for economic development. Very few economies have actually achieved structural transformation without manufacturing-led growth, and this is also the case in the recent past, not just, you know, throughout, if you're, not just throughout a 300-year time span or so. So empirically, the exceptions you see to this are mostly island states who are, oh, sorry, not island states, small states who are abundant uh, on natural resources, so for example, nation states in the Arabian Peninsula, you have also some island states that can manage to achieve this transformation of the economy without manufacturing. But by and large, my contention is that countries generally need manufacturing to achieve this transformation from low to high income. There are also some interesting measurement issues that put into question the supposed decline in manufacturing output. So if if I would show you a graph right now of manufacturing output as share of GDP across the world, you'd probably see decreasing in most of the world. How does that make sense with what I just told you? Um, well, what a lot of these charts that present this global decrease in manufacturing looking at different regions in the world don't tell you is that for the most part, yes, most world regions, most countries in the world have seen deindustrialization or premature deindustrialization, but it's mainly to, due to relocation to one country. One country has taken over manufacturing output. Does anyone want to take a guess at which country this is? China, okay, I'm just making sure you're listening to my talk. Um, so essentially, China has taken over uh, world manufacturing output. Of course, that's a simplified statement, but it's still somewhat true. Um, there's a really interesting paper published by researchers at the UN Development uh, um, sorry, the UN Industrial Development Organization that shows how globally the share of manufacturing in GDP and employment, so not regionally, but in the entire world, has actually not changed much over the last few decades. And the second mega trend I look at that supports this argument that traditional industrialization and factory-based production remains crucial for economic development touches upon automation technologies. Now, just a quick clarification here. When I say traditional industrialization, I do not mean that industrialization today looks the exact same way it has looked 200 years ago. It's very, very different. But I simply mean this idea of manufacturing-led growth. So there is, um, there are arguments and evidence put forth that uh, automation is replacing human labor. And some of you might have come across this argument that uh, because historically uh, countries that have industrialized and grew, grown their economies have relied on labor-intensive industrialization in early stages, this path is closed off, right? For example, Danny Roderick suggests this kind of argument. If you actually start looking at the really granular studies on automation's impact on job displacement, you'll find that Automation technologies, not only in the distant past, because automation technologies have actually been around for more than 200 years, but also in the recent past, and also those that look at forecast studies, find that automation technologies create and will keep creating more jobs than they have displaced. So, of course, automation dis displaces jobs. That's the definition. It's disruptive in some sectors, for sure. But they also have this impact on increased productivity growth, economy-wide, and also within firms that often get, gets lost in uh, these arguments. I should also say that the buzz around this topic remains highly Eurocentric. So a lot of the studies that focuses on automation's impact on job loss only have data 
from European and North American countries, even the ones that claim to be global. So you should read with a dose of skepticism when you see headlines in the Financial Times talking about the global impact of automation on jobs, when in reality they're only talking about five world economies. Okay, So we actually don't have that much data on the impact of automation on job displacement in uh, the global south, and there are also a lot of barriers to implementing new digital automation technologies in developing countries. Um, so we need also to talk about commercialization and scale-up issues when it comes to new technologies, which is missing a lot from this debate. So that is kind of a snapshot of the two first mega trends I look at in the book and how they relate to that key argument. So let's just see how am I doing on time. Do I have about 15 minutes or so? More? Yeah. 15 plus? OK, perfect. So the second argument of, uh, of the book, I've now said that industrialization matters still quite a bit. And from sort of the lens of looking at how disruptive technology is, I argue that actually maybe it's not as disruptive as some people say. It's achievable in terms of creating jobs, in terms of being the driver of innovation. But on this point, I'm saying that actually the future of the factory is more uncertain. The future of industrialization is a bit more uncertain when we take into account power asymmetries in the world economy. And my contention is that they are creating uneven opportunities to reap uh, the benefits from industrialization. One lens to look at this as, uh, one lens to look at this from is through the globalization of production. Now, the globalization of production both helps and hinders industrialization in the South. So when I talk about the globalization of production, I, I'm essentially talking here about these new nodes of production, these global value chains, these global supply chains, the way production has become globally fragmented over, over the years, right? So thank you very much. I'll keep the mic close. Um, so for example, to become internationally competitive in the automotive industry today, um, a country does not have to, or a developing country does not have to uh, specialize in producing all the components of a car. It's also possible to be part of this global industry by, for example, assembling a car. So in some ways, industrialization or being internationally competitive has become easier because you need less capabilities domestically, right? This is the idea of globalized production. Um, and generally, if we assume that participating in international trade is good, and we can, of course, go down that rabbit hole, but for now, let's leave it at that, then globalization of production has helped economic development. However, I'm more interested in an argument that I think has been somewhat overlooked in mainstream economics, which is how globalization of production hinders uh, economic development by squeezing the profits of countries, firms, and workers in the global south. Now, what do I mean by this? So one way I illustrate this uh, in my book is through this figure right here. Just a quick show of hands, how many uh, have seen this figure before, or a version of it? OK, some of you. So, this is, shows you, uh, it shows you the smile curve. And I haven't, I'm not the inventor of the smile curve. Um, it was invented by the CEO of Acer, Stan Shi. Um, so someone from the corporate world. And this is my version of uh, the smile curve. Um, and it shows, I argue, and also you know, based on smile curves out there that we've seen a deepening smile of global value chain over of global value chains over the last few decades, right? So especially for activities carried out in the global south, like manufacturing assembly, they've seen a decreasing share of value going to those activities, whereas that stage of production of a product carried out by companies in the global north, so pre-production services like research and development and design and post-production services like marketing and retail, they've seen an increasing share uh, of revenue uh, go to th those companies who specialize in that, see an increasing share of the revenue go to those kinds of activities. You know, one way of thinking of this is through the Apple iPhone, right? The a Apple 
makes iPhones. Well, it says it makes iPhones, but Apple doesn't actually have any physical factories, right? They outsource most of the production to contract manufacturers, also assembly. Assembly is just part of things here, right? Uh, some manufacturing is more higher value than just assembly. But I'll get back to the iPhone example. But still, iPhone, without actually making any of the components of the phone, rakes in more than half of the final retail price of the phone. This is a relatively new phenomenon that we didn't see in the 60s or the 70s. That non, well, companies that don't actually have these factories make so much from it. So, activities in value chains that are carried out in the global south, less value activities in value chains that are carried out in the global north, more value, that's a general argument. Now, what drives this? There are a lot of factors here. One is increased global competition between uh, countries, especially between developing countries. We have more countries in the world right now um, participating in uh, the world economy and more labor participating in the global labor force. Um, through increasing power of transnational corporations based in the global north. And this power is fortified by strong protection of intellectual property, uh, as, and which is again fortified by uh, trade agreements, for example, the uh, agreement related to intellectual property in the World Trade Organization. Uh, and one example I want to give you here is the iPhone. So I talked a little bit about this. This is a chart that actually shows you the distribution of value for iPhones released between 2010 and 2018. Here I've taken, uh, I've calculated, I've, I've made these numbers based on three studies that look at the value distribution of three different iPhones in this time period. And here you see how much Apple rakes in from the final retail price. Still some companies that manufacture components, there's still, still some value in that, but the most labor intensive part of the production process, assembly, gets less than 3% of the final retail pr price. This is also important to note and to understand because then we also understand more about the dire situation of workers in global production networks, especially in the global south. So what, what can we do about this? Um, I have you know, one uh, well, part of my book that looks at industrial policy and global governance in this era of globalized production. On the left here, you see a few instruments that I suggest that can be used domestically to try and compete in this world of powerful multinational corporations based in high-income countries. Because I want to say, yes, there are structures in the international, well, there are structures in the world economy that in a way are unfair, but it does, does not mean that all hope is lost for developing countries, right? And for example, we've seen uh, China, now, whether or not we consider China to be the global south or the global north today, that can be debated, but in its development process has, for example, used many of these tools to try and compete against transnational corporations, like using state-owned enterprises or bargaining with foreign uh, investors. Here I talk about uh, reforming the international trade system so as to make it more fair rather than free. There's been a lot of focus in international organizations that we need to support free trade. Sure, trade is in some ways good, but this emphasis on free trade in a world where the playing field isn't level exacer exacerbates these power asymmetries, right? So I suggest reforms to the WTO to ensure greater policy space and also to make it democratic and focus more on antitrust and anti-monopoly laws and also that we need to see more agreements within the area of trade between countries of, of similar levels of income, especially in the global south. Okay. Now, if you study this table here, there's a, it's a lot to take in. Maybe you should make note of particularly some of these that you find especially controversial or eye-opening and ask me a question about it afterwards and I'll be happy to talk more. Um, I also think we can talk about power asymmetries in the world economy uh, in, through the lens of looking at ecological breakdown and challenges of uh, industrialization related to ecological breakdown. Um, 
In this chapter of my book where I look at this mega trend ecological breakdown, what I try to do is uh, combine some, lit some literatures within political ecology and political economy to understand industrialization challenges, especially in the global south. We've seen this emergence of literature on green industrial policy and green growth and how productivity growth and growth can be quote unquote green. I also try to uh, look at some of this emerging literature on degrowth and if in fact um, it's sustainable to adopt this idea and sustainable in its true meaning environmentally to adopt this idea that green industrial policy is a path that is uh, feasible. And especially I talk about uh, global justice in this respect and then when we talk about green industrial policies and also how some policies need to focus on uh, degrowing economies, we need to understand that some economies have more or should have more space for non-environmentally friendly policies and some should have less because that is the nature of the world we live in in terms of who is responsible for ecological breakdown. Let me just elaborate a bit what I mean, right? So when we talk about the challenge of industrialization in the context of ecological breakdown, we need to ask this question seriously. Can the pursuit of productivity growth and economic growth be truly green, okay? And this is a question that I think the literature on industrial policy hasn't focused enough on. Look at this chart right here. It shows the correlation between growth of output, so essentially economic growth, and material use. So this is the use uh, of the Earth's resources. It normally, in the, ecology, in the political ecology literature, combines some measure of the use of minerals, metals, uh, biomass and fossil fuels, right? So essentially all that is in the earth, right? So it's not only talking about global warming here, it takes into account to some degree climate change and global warming because we talk about fossil fuels, but also all the other stuff that's extracted from the earth that we use for production and consumption. So here you see clearly that growth, if it goes on forever, is not compatible with having one planet, unless somehow we find a way to recycle everything. So in this respect, there is some irony to the climate change movement, okay? Um, the movement that focuses on reaching net zero. Reaching net zero is incredibly important, right? Because global warming is the most uh, serious ecological issue right now, okay? But even if we reach net zero, there are other ecological problems that will continue because we keep using the Earth's resources, okay? I like to use the electric vehicle industry as an example. Say, hypothetically, today, if the entire automotive fleet of the world was changed from fossil fuel driven cars to electrically, uh, electrically uh, driven vehicles, would we have enough lithium or cobalt to sustain this transformation right now. There are debates around this, but I'd say probably not, okay? So we also need to tackle this issue of not just increased, well, unsustainable energy, of fossil fuel driven energy use, but also increased uh, resource use in our discussion on green industrialization and green industrial policy, right? Look at this stat right here, the share of fossil fuels in Final energy demand globally didn't change for this decade from 2010 to 2020, staying firmly at 80%. This was a decade when we saw lots of measures to green the world economy. Why is it because increasing supply of clean energy is not keeping up with increasing demand? So we need to address the scale of production and consumption in thinking about green industrialization and industrial policy. Now here comes a very important point. The responsibility for ecological breakdown globally isn't even, okay? It's far from even. This graph shows you the shares of global excess resource use 1970 to 2017 all over the world. You see that high-income countries are responsible, unsurprisingly, for more than 70%. 
upper middle income countries still a bit, but lower middle income countries and low income countries barely any responsibility for ecological breakdown. There's one shortcoming of this chart, one shortcoming that the authors of the study that I base this chart on also admit that it doesn't take into account what's happened from the first industrial revolution onwards, right? What would this chart look like if they had data going all the way back? What would it look like? Even more skewed. Even more skewed, exactly. Thank you. You're still paying attention. Great. Um, okay. So I talk about towards green industrial policy 2.0 in my book. Okay. Or you can call it a progressive, a more progressive theory of green industrial policy than what's been suggested. Now, this is kind of green industrial policy summarized. This is my summary of green industrial policy in the current literature. A lot of a lot about a lot of it is about more public investment in clean energy, uh, policies and incentives for the private sector to reduce emissions, identifying green windows of opportunities for countries in the global south. This is, these are all good things, don't get me wrong. But I also think in our thinking about industrial policy, we also need to talk about how, because industrial policy <clears throat> literature actually talks a little bit about sustainably scaling down some industries. Historically, this has been about you know job uh, consideration. But for environmental considerations, we also need to talk more about what industries need to be scaled down. Um, is there, does it make sense to shift from, from individual to more community-centered living? And here I'm thinking about simple measures that I've been taking in some cities around the world, like more incentives for public transport rather than private cars, right? We don't need more electric vehicles, we need more electric buses, right? That's a simple idea here. And this third one is very, very important. We need to have climate justice in mind. When we talk about who needs to really take into consideration this idea of degrowing some production and consumption, well, the responsibility lies with countries in the global north. I say that countries in the global south need to have, quote unquote, more ecological policy space. So that's. It for that should give you kind of a snapshot of these four mega trends that I look at. Um, I gave you, you know, only a snapshot, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. But I'm also sure that all the topics that I covered here hopefully stimulated a lot of question and some things you'd like to debate now. But if I can kind of rehash two points about the book, these would be the two points. The first one is that if we're interested in economic prosperity and development. Industrialization remains key, right? We saw it very recently, um, and not just in developing countries. Countries like the United States is trying to re-industrialize its economy, right? So this idea of industrialization is not just an issue of sort of development any longer from a global south perspective, but also European countries are now trying to become more competitive and North American countries in some industries. And the second conclusion is that really need to understand when we talk about global governance and the realm of international political economy that the playing field right now isn't level and that we need to more strongly emphasize this idea of putting policies in place to level the playing field right think about this word competitiveness like it's thrown around in the news everywhere as if if it's normal that countries compete against each other but isn't it a bit weird that we live in a world economy organized around the principles of sovereign states actually being in this game against each other, competing against each other. Well, if we accept that that's the nature of affairs, if we accept that that's the truth, we definitely need to ensure that the playing field is level, and right now, it's not. Thank you very much. So, First of all, let me say thank you, uh, Cecilia, for organizing this session, and thanks, Jostein, for joining us. Also, warm congratulations on such a successful book. I'm, I'm aware that it has received an excellent welcome so far, and I'm sure it will continue doing so. So, congratulations. So, a few words, uh, general words on the, the book, and then some comments or questions. 
first, I really enjoyed it and I believe it, it has particular value exactly for the endeavors that you announced you would embrace. So, uh, and that I would say you brilliantly achieved. So first of all, you managed with this book to kind of popularize uh, to make accessible some debates that are, yes, at the interface between policymaking and academia, but they often stay separate. And they, you did so making them very approachable, very accessible. This is a value uh, not only for scholars, academic scholars that work on the topic, because this gives you an overview of all themes together most academics focus on separate topics and don't talk to each other. So the overview is very useful for academics, but is uh, also uh, very useful for all non-academics, uh, or non-academic audience that can easily read about debates that often stay confined within academia. <clears throat> so both uh, ways, this, is, this book is very valuable. Um, from a structural viewpoint, I, I really appreciated the way you uh, shift from um, some mainstream arguments and uh, heterodox arguments, but staying kind of uh, uh, in, not impartial, but within the chapters. And only at the end, you draw all your conclusions. In, until chapter six, you don't really influence the reader so much, but you let the reader draw conclusions at the end with you. So you stay a bit on the outside and then you draw your conclusions and your policy implications. I think uh, from a, a style point of view, a structure point of view, that is very interesting and very, <clears throat> and very valuable. In terms of specific um, chapters, I particularly liked the chapter on the ecological breakdown. I found it not only comprehensive, but also very, very brave and very honest in what's out there and what we need to engage with. Um, <clears throat> finally, from a, a, <clears throat> a contents perspective, I particularly appreciated how you engage with the traditional theories of industrial policies on concepts related to growth, productivity, technological change that scholars in industrial policy are familiar with. But you also included in the same book uh, concepts like uh, the idea of global poverty network, engaging with labor debates. You did, were not scared of talking about imperialism in the past and in the present. Uh, you engaged uh, honestly with this debate on reforming the WTO and also mentioned th these debates on degrowth that sometimes in academia say a bit like taboos. Uh, so overall, like this is, uh, um, this was very, I, I really liked it. And I also liked in particular the way throughout the book you keep a very firm position towards the, the, the issue of north-south divides and the need to protect the policy space in developing countries. I mean, I'm a development economist as well, um, <clears throat> trying to always place emphasis on the global south in all the research <laughs> teams where I work. And I know this is not something to give for granted, especially among scholars on industrial policy. Not everyone is concerned with the global south. So these are really, uh, really appreciated. Uh, now, as a scholar on in that works on industrial policy and the global south, uh, and that also engaged with your work before, I remember how I used your report on transformative industrial policy. Uh, for Africa when I taught a course on industrial policy in South Africa. This was very helpful. I would like to engage with all your megatrends, all your conclusions, but I can't do so. I would be annoying and, <laughs> and I would go uh, beyond the time I was given. So I would select a few, like four points I want to raise. Um, now, these are not in, like critiques in per se, but these are points where I would appreciate like uh, to dig a bit more, to, to elaborate a bit more. Overall, I mean, I can say I largely agreed with um, both your analysis and most of your conclusions, so uh, it's not 
nothing is a deep disagreement, it's just curiosity too. So the first one is related to the issue of uh, <clears throat> the growth of services. So what you treat in the first as first mega trend. I mean, I agree on the increasing weight the, the, the service sector assumes on the interconnectedness uh, between manufacturing and service and with the need, this is very interesting as a policy conclusion, uh, for future industrial policy intervention to target entire value chains, so considering different productive segments as integrated. This is certainly, um, I, I totally agree with it. However, uh, I was wondering, in these conclusions, po rather positive conclusions uh, on the way service can trigger productivity also in the Global South, how you uh, exactly account for the variety of services, because you mentioned some categories of services, but the service sector is very heterogeneous. So there are low, high value added seg uh, segments, segments that, uh, uh, that uh, <coughs> lead to uh, low or bad quality, uh, like uh, <coughs> bad or good quality jobs, etc. In particular, I would like to know more about this distinction you made between unproductive and productive uh, services and on these conclusions about service-led growth. Because especially that it can lead uh, or it has often led to higher productivity also in the Global South. Now, there is a, a li like significant literature that warns against the imbalances of service-led sector, also in the countries that you mentioned, in Africa and in India. Uh, how do, do do dig into this? Because, I mean, saying service-led uh, growth can imply, it can depend on the type of sector, for example. It can be uh, ICT, it can be tourism, it can be construction driven, it can be BPO driven. These sectors have different implications in terms of growth, productivity and development. So how do you uh, differentiate between these? Now, moving on the uh, on the second point, uh, on this service-led, the British can tell us a lot, for example, on Rwanda as well. <clears throat> uh, on the issue of deindustrialization, I mean, I agree with your broad conclusion that is quite optimistic, that it reflects uh, a geographical restructuring of manufacturing at global level and the, co the likely concentration within large populous countries like China. But I think uh, there is, uh, and you do it in some parts of the book, but maybe it's not exactly reflected in your conclusions. I think there is a, a further need to differentiate between global deindustrialization, so the shift toward between serv service and manufacturing, and this deindustrialization that happens at country level, a bit more because it is a doom trend that, that happens, uh, that, that is damaging at country level, and a further need to differentiate between premature de deindustrialization in low and middle income countries or the industrialization that happens in the global north. Uh, the effects are very different. So just to say the, uh, this could be reflected more in your conclusions on the industrialization. Third point, I don't know if I have other few minutes. One yeah, well, uh, two minutes, okay. On automated digital technologies and related job displacement, I agree with your warning against hypes and that to the dimension, to contain the excessive fear or the excessive alarmism uh, saying all jobs will be displaced. But I also uh, think that this consideration of uh, a net employment at the end is not totally helpful. It's helpful to uh, warn against hypes but at the same time, and you highlight that these are kind of missing, but micro studies highlighting exactly what jobs will be displaced and what, where, what segments will gain, 
are more helpful, not easy to find. We partly did it with uh, different studies in different sectors on the impact of 4IR technologies in South Africa, in Thailand partly. But it's helpful to know where jobs will, will be displaced and where jobs will be created. A, to prepare in advance. Even unions, for example, need to prepare in advance to protect against job losses. But for two reasons related to the Global South. First, because each job is precious. So uh, knowing where jobs will be lost is very important because uh, these countries can't afford the further unemployment. And second, because uh, jobs that are created often correspond to areas where there is a shortage, where there are skilled gaps. And so building capabilities to fill those gaps is very difficult. So granular studies, as you call them, need to be there uh, to complement because otherwise we won't be prepared. Final point. I uh, totally agree. I told you already that I really like the chapter on uh, <clears throat> ecological breakdown, and I agree that this is one of the biggest challenges when rethinking industrial policies. Uh, but I would like to hear a bit more on this idea to, uh, to provide more ecological policy space to, uh, the, to southern countries. Uh, I agree with giving more policy space, but what does it exactly mean ecological policy space? There are the, we could also read the, some negative implications, and I was thinking negative or dangerous implications. For example, how do you distinguish between small and big polluters within the global south, or um, uh, how do you avo avoid this feeling that basically these countries can do anything now? <laughs> Uh, because they still need to build advanced capabilities to then be able to afford being more ecologically sustainable. I mean, can we really afford this uh, planetary level? I don't know. Uh, last danger that I found in this argument is that uh, this argument would be stronger in if industrial capa capacity in these countries and ownership overlapped or corresponded, but often there are uh, companies from the global south that keep their manufacturing base in uh, from the global north that keep their manufacturing base in the south exactly because the ecological um, standards are lower. So all how do you account for these uh, <clears throat> nuances within your argument if you can expand on that? And I'll stop because I over... I surpassed my, my time, but thank you very much again. Yeah, uh, okay, well, th uh, thanks so, so much, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here at UCL IIPP, which uh, I think we all know has a great reputation for being at the head of discussions of state-led development, state-led innovation, at the interface of government and policy making. So thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Lorenza, for organizing this event. I'll try and keep my mic properly. I have a very bad record of doing this, but I won't go into that. But uh, yeah. So also, it's a real pleasure, again, to engage with your science book. Uh, the last time I did this, I was the chair, so I hadn't read the book. But now I read it cover <laughs> to cover, you know? Uh, so it's, a, it's really great also, because you're in, you're, in a way, presenting this at the perfect place because your book in a way speaks to academia, but also strives to be at this interface between government and policy making, both in the global north and the global south, right? So it was really wonderful to, to read it fully. And it's really easy to read, approachable, probably good for students to use in industrial competitiveness classes or, or development studies classes more generally. So your science book basically looks at how contemporary industrialization is shaped by four trends, right? Services, uh, digital technologies, GVCs, or global fragmentation of production, whatever you want to call it. There are many different terms. And ecological breakdown. There's a really good summary of these issues. There's cre clearly an attempt to be nuanced about this, to think about this both from the Global North perspective about what's happening there, highlighting that most of the literature on this is about the Global North. So how do you look at it about the Global South? Um, 
and really trying to center how late developing countries will achieve these twin goals of promoting structural transformation, which I think Robert Wade was in the audience earlier. He's pointed out previously that less than 10 countries outside the industrialized or former colonizing countries have done this. I mean, not colonizing, Europe and North America have done this. And most of them are in East Asia. In, uh, in particular, I would agree with Lorenzo that uh, your science chapter on ecological breakdown is really interesting. I, I've told him before, I really like this concept of ecological policy space. I think you, I'll go into this a bit more also, um, about how this affects contemporary late development. And he sketches out the academic discussions and in a nuanced way, uh, both in terms of automation and the ecological breakdown. Um, I, of course, I agree that uh, this concept of ecological policy space, in a way, countries should have more ecological policy space. That countries should have more agency to do what they want in relation to environmental policy. Uh, there is this implicit suggestion that countries are being forced to implement environmental policy. But I think if you go back to your last slide, you talk about the competition within the global political economy and how industrial policy is about that. Strangely now, um, ODA is much less than the funding that goes towards green cl uh, climate policy. And I wonder if actually countries are being incentivized to promote in uh, environmental policy rather than being forced. And it's a way for them to get other money. But anyway, we can talk about this a bit more and I'll try and develop it. So overall, I think this book is just an excellent introduction to the issues facing developing countries as they embark on these twin goals of industrialization and addressing climate change. And it is a very optimistic, and it's important to be optimistic, uh, look at what should happen if the world, if we, if we could do whatever we want and hope for the best. So my questions really are, I'll start with the policy dimension to this. And um, I think there is a lot of optimism about what countries should do about the WTO sh should be reformed. And in one place you do talk about how it's important to look at the politics of why this may happen or may not be happening. Um, what do you think really are the political obstructions to countries having more ecological policy space, to the WTO being reformed? Because it's very difficult a lot of this has been discussed for a long time that the WTO should be reformed. And we all kind of, most people would agree that it should be. But it isn't happening. So why would it happen now? Um, and Lorenza has, or but not just about the WTO, but also why would, a country, why would developing countries have more ecological policies with, when Global North countries are simply not doing anything they commit to, whereas Global South countries are m implementing much more in many cases. Um, so in relation to the point about services, there I know in your slides you did talk about, you were a bit more negative about services in your slides, about the propensity for low wage employment, about insecure employment, etc., which I think is all true. But in the book you seem a mu much more positive about high um, about services having this kind of productivity potential. Services also includes finance, finance and finan financialization, which of course is cl clearly an obstruction to industrial policy. Because for example, East Asia and most European countries had state-owned finance and directed finance to industrial policy, whereas that avenue was broken after structural adjustment. And for 30 years, conventionally, in the conventional ways that previous countries didn't use, use the financial sector for industrial policy, most countries can't do that. And there's still, the first thing the World Bank and IMF does is ask you to liberalize your financial sector, um, open up your capital accounts, etc. Um, I thought also, interestingly, in the book you really talked, you did a good job of talking about why deglobalization is not taking place after COVID. And you talked about how this rise of onshoring is a myth about factories coming back to uh, the global north. But then in the conclusion, you're very, you go back on this a little bit and you say, maybe I'm 
wrong about this. I just wanted to, you to develop this a bit more because you say after the Ukraine war, who knows what will happen and maybe deglobalization will continue. So you kind of went back on, I thought you had argued against it quite well. And lastly, I think, uh, you seem to frame industrial policy, your definition is much more around value creation, going into higher value sectors, higher value export sectors. Now, we've talked about, and Lorenza touched on this as well, that empl uh, employment is a major challenge, particularly there is a lot of underemployment rather than unemployment in the statistics, right? Um, also, um, a lot of people are employed in the informal sector, which doesn't feature much in your discussions. I mean, the majority of people in most developing countries. Um, so a lot of industrial policy, state-owned enterprise, and the state is still a major employer in most countries, I mean, um, is quite wasteful. It's not going into higher value sectors, it's going mostly to domestic market. So what would you say about that industrial policy versus just export-oriented industrial policy? Should one be ditched and the other kept? Because some industrial policy has social purposes, and it's still useful in some ways. I mean, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. I suggest now, um, we have 30 minutes in total and we really want to get questions from the audience. So I will give you the mic back, but I can only ask you if you can be very brief, like let's say five minutes. I know that it will not do justice to your comments and I'm very sorry for asking you this, um, which is definitely tough and I know, but maybe you can just keep some of the thoughts and probably they will be also be useful for questions that will come from the audience or something like that. Would it work? Thank you. I mean, five minutes is more than enough, and and uh, I'm not going to cover all your your feedback. And I, you know, in providing all these thoughts, I think you also probably you know stimulated some ideas, some thoughts, some question among the audience. Um, but just, I just really need to say thank you for reading. Uh, the entire book, which I can tell you I've done and also picked up on. You know, here you said something that was a bit different than what you said in the book, and I'm like, I agree with you. You're right. Now I can expand on that. Thank you. Now I can say, well, actually, it depends. Um, so thank you for reading the book, and I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it, which I, it sounded like you did. Um, and let me touch upon a few of the, the comments so I don't surpass five minutes and give you all the chance to say some some words and ask some questions. Um, and I'll just choose the ones that I think are most important to address. Um, and one, starting with something you both talked about, um, elaborating a bit, a little bit on this, you know, manufacturing versus services as drivers of growth, which ones are you know, high value, low value. I think this is a really, really important topic. Because when I listen to myself giving this presentation, I'm kind of saying that, you know, manufacturing is what matters. In reality, for those of us who are interested in understanding the process of economic development through the lens of structural transformation, productive capabilities, this categorization, manufacturing services versus services versus agriculture, this national accounts, <coughs> classification in and of itself is unimportant. You might be a bit surprised to hear me say this, but really what we should be interested in is, you know, what are the high value, where do the high value opportunities lie? Uh, where do the produ productive opportunities lie in terms of stimulating productivity growth? I argue that, you know, most of them lie in something within manufacturing or manufacturing related. But ultimately, you know, in agriculture also, because in agriculture you're dependent on agriculture, machinery, pesticides, fertilizer, mechanized warehouses and services. So these sectors of the economy also overlap. And it's not actually that easy to figure out, you know, which is which. Um, so take that, like, if you got the idea that, you know, I have this fetishism with manufacturing, okay, take that with a grain of salt. Like, um, yeah, it's really about broad-based value-added and productivity growth. Um, kind of talking a little bit about services that are really productive. In my book, I provide examples of two cities in India, Hyderabad and Bangalore, that have achieved amazing growth based on 
export oriented services that are not manufacturing related. <laughs> These are often in the IT sector or the ICT sector. Uh, oftentimes have a lot to do with software development. So these are this is an example of service-based specialization that's high value that potentially can employ people and that's exportable. And that allows me to segue to this idea, does industrial policy have to target exports? Uh, or does industrial policy have to be export oriented? So I would say, you know, throughout the history of capitalism, when we've seen examples of rapid catch-up development, there has been a strong element of becoming internationally competitive, okay, and focusing on exports. And we've seen, for those of us who've studied failed industrialization experience, you know, failed import substitution industrialization strategies, failed protectionist strategies, that there isn't enough emphasis on exports. That is not to say that, uh, you know, domestic production should be neglected from a jobs perspective, but I think in the, you know, in the world economy today, um, successful industrialization strategies need to focus on making firms competitive on the world market. Um, okay, let me talk a little bit about ecological policy space. Um, well, one reason why I pitched this idea was, you know, I saw all this work being done on green industrialization and why developing countries and opportunities for developing countries to, uh, to be green. And I think that's good. And I also see this really interesting work on so-called green windows of opportunities, the idea that countries can take advantage of developing technologies in new markets for energy, like say solar and wind, like Brazil is doing, like China is doing in electric vehicles and become competitive that way. That is unambiguously good from a development perspective. I guess also from a climate perspective. But I thought there wasn't enough focus on this idea of, well, we are in this mess right now uh, of ecological breakdown. Certain national governments and certain countries have so much more responsibility for getting us out of this mess, and not because only of what they've done historically, but also of what's happening right now in these countries, in North America, in Europe. So I think it's also worth talking about, as I said, not only these green industrialization strategies, but also these strategies for limiting some production and consumption. However, I'm saying, then we need to focus on global justice. Then we need to focus on the global north. Obviously, you know, a whole can of worms about export-oriented industrialization opens up then. Um, and I don't have all the answers to that question. But, you know, I think we need to s rather soon also, you know, shift our focus a little bit more in terms of climate justice globally, also more focus on climate reparations, remittances. I think this is going to be, and I hope it becomes a more central part, part of this debate going forward. And let me say that there are some things that I neglect in the book uh, or, or, you know, some nuances between, well, some nuances that gets missed because of my distinction between global so south and global north, right? Of course, there are polluters in countries in the global south, right? I think a lot, a lot of research now has shown, and there was, a, the Guardian did a huge kind of, uh, I think they published something like 20 articles recently on how the rich are really the ones polluting, right? And there are also there are rich people in countries in the global south who really contribute to ecological breakdown. And there are people um, in countries in the global north who do not contribute to ecological breakdown. So this distinction, again, should be, you know, there are caveats to this somewhat simplified distinction between the global south and the global north, especially when it comes to who are responsible for ecological breakdown. That's also why I talk about kind of taxing consumption habits of the rich as a green policy suggestion. Um, should I maybe stop there? I can talk, yeah, WTO reforms, let's maybe, let's maybe, open. yeah, let's maybe open up. So I will pass the floor to Giovanni first. Hi, hi everybody. 
thank you so much for the presentation. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I have two questions. One, if you could uh, disentangle it, disentangle a bit better, I think the trade-offs that are there when we talk about green industrial policy 2.0 as having uh, a component of reduction, uh, especially for countries in the global north, especially to leave, of course, justly more space for development for the global south countries, especially when nowadays the production of many highly polluting industries happen in middle-income countries. I'm thinking about steel, I'm thinking about fossil fuels, and um, so how, how can we, how, you know, if you reduce consumption on one side, you, you impact the production in these countries. Um, and, and so ways in which to mitigate this, uh, ways to address, disentangle a bit better the kind of trade of the one would, uh, I mean, uh, from the presentation, it seemed to me like it was a bit straightforward. Yeah, the South produ produces more and the North uh, restricts its uh, economy, but I would like to disentangle a bit more potential trade-offs there. And the second question is about, uh, trying to level the playing field and uh, um, you know sometimes uh, more often industrial policy is thought about in the opposite way so you tilt the playing field uh, through industrial policy uh, to to pick the winners and um, um, what I, I wonder whether leveling the playing field would actually mean tilting it in favor of global south countries so leveling the playing field would mean that they would be allowed to do more industrial policy and other countries, global north country, would be would be allowed to do less because that's the other side of the coin. What, do you agree with it or uh, or not? <laughs> Thank you so much. So I, I think that maybe I can collect one, two more questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My name is Antonius, a PhD student from the UCL. Uh, my question is uh, between uh, different with uh, to differentiate global north and global south, uh, and also reflecting the the current wars. I I, I, wa I want to uh, ask about how BRICS uh, uh, coalition, like a uh, uh, that uh, also uh, involves China there, that uh, have a state uh, involvement in all their industrial policy that yeah you say it like a, a have a good progress uh to deal with the ec ecological breakdown like uh, are you proposing uh, and also in the other side we have not nato they have a democracies led so like uh, i want to ask uh yeah you you mentioned about the growth how about the uh, state form are are you also endorse like a state led industrial policy or like uh, you still believe in the free markets uh, capitalism. Thank you. So I will allow myself to add a question or maybe a few, but you can pick the one you want. And they're just to, yeah, to to spark more debate if you want. But first, um, part of the goal or what you're showing as the aim of what uh, was to uh, get productivity uh, growth and shall this be the goal and I really think that and it's not only a question about growth and degrowth uh, related to ecological breakdown or hardships but it's a more fundamental question that I think that sometimes we get too trapped in the idea of uh, have productivity growth because one sometimes we are still trapped in the idea that productivity growth directly goes to workers and and this comes from neoclassical economics way of thinking about how salaries are supposed to be reflecting uh, what we are contributing as workers to the production process. And uh, we wide and large know that that's, that's not the case. So first of all, even with productivity growth, that doesn't mean that people will live better. But also when it comes to a core and periphery discussion, again, uh, just productivity growth doesn't mean that peripheral countries will be able to keep uh, the value that they are producing. And this allows me precisely to connect to the other part of my question, which is that one thing of the smile curve and the discussions on global value chain is that, and this is why also some of the critiques work along the lines of global poverty uh, networks or, or even also the global production network idea is that 
we should discuss more or distinguish more, and this is at the core of IIPP as well, between value creation and value capture. Because, and, and this goes back to the idea, okay, uh, it's not that we subjectively value more manufacturing than R&D or R&D more than manufacturing. It's the fact that the steps of the production process are scattered around the world and those uh, that capture some of those steps manage to capture more value than uh, the one they are contributing to. So yeah, so I would like to hear your thoughts about this if we have the time, but otherwise you can focus on the other questions, of course. And then we will have another quick round of questions with some of the people that are online as well. Can you just reiterate the very last question? Yeah, it's about value capture and, and value creation. If you can distinguish more, or if you can comment more on your thoughts about that, uh, when you were discussing about value and, and the role of value, it wasn't clear to me um, yeah, how you would position yourself along those lines. Like if, if, for, if the difference for you is meaningful, um, how would you think, especially in relation, of course, to the globalization of production? just to make it clear that because if you even upgrade in the global value chain uh, in peripheral countries, that may not necessarily mean that the countries will be able to capture the extra value that they are producing. And there is also a lot of research, well, um, Benjamin Selwyn's research, which is the global poverty chain or network now, I'm on, on the fact that even the companies producing from the global south in global value chains, they are at the productive frontier. It's just that, first of all, that uh, is also that also comes with a lot of internal polarization in the country and also that they not uh, they are not necessarily able to capture the value they are producing. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you very much. And okay, lots of interesting things to um, to address here. Um, shall we start with it? Do I support the state or free market capitalism? <laughs> um, no, I'll get there second. But I have an answer. Um, I, I want to start with, you know, should the goal only be productivity growth? I'm glad you brought this up. Um, you know, I talked about economic development through the lens of structural transformation, industrialization. What about people, right? Um, it's important to understand that when we talk about, you know, these economic development and use indicators or metrics, GDP growth, or uh, more manufacturing value added as a share of GDP. It's just a means to an end. In the end, what we really want is better well-being for people. And when we talk about economic development, I would dare say we are primarily talking about better material standards of living for people. Obviously, well-being and development broadly is more than that, which is also very much worth pursuing and talking about and debating and addressing. Um, I would still contend, maybe this is controversial, that in the long term, when a country achieves this structural transformation and productivity growth, historically most people have been better off. Now, this is not saying that throughout this process it's, uh, you know, uh, labor rights have been properly, oh no, so, sorry, labor issues have been properly addressed, right? There's a whole literature on, you know, labor suppression in Korea under industrialization. And even now you can go to Foxconn factories in China and you can say China has lifted more people out of poverty than the rest of the world put together in the last 30 years on the one hand. And on the other hand, there are really dire and bad working conditions there. And, you know, I address this a little bit in my book talking about, you know, I also talked about we need to start talking about fighting for a global minimum wage in the UN. General Assembly, I say the UN General Assembly because the ILO also represents business interests in addition to workers' interests. Um, we need to also start supporting this idea that industrialization and healthy industrialization can happen through, um, through actually uh, improving labor standards. I have one of my papers on Ethiopia that actually shows how when you disregard labor standards, you can get turnover rates so high that it hampers productivity growth and industrialization. So, um, if, yeah. Um, you know, on the state market debate, um, one, one question I got from a reviewer of the book in the end was, um, so I've read all of this and uh, it's still a little bit unclear to me if you embrace or, or 
do, do not embrace capitalism. Uh -huh. I understand the last yeah, so I was like, so he says, well, the, the, uh, the reviewer said specifically, um, uh, should we embrace or transcend capitalism? So I decided to end the book with a section, should we embrace or transcend capitalism? <laughs> um, and on this, yeah, on, on this question, I am, I am, I am ambiguous um, because I draw on lots of socialist, very clearly socialist theories from degrowth, Marxist-inspired theories, as particularly as it relates to dependency theory, feeds a lot in my book. So I'm very much inspired by socialist theories, but at the same time, I talk about meaningful reforms we can achieve under capitalism. But on your question, I would say I think I'm pretty clear in the book that. Um, you know, the role of the state has been and will always be important, right? So when people ask me, because I do a lot of work on industrial policy, um, you know, what, industrial policy can fail, right? State-owned enterprises can fail. And I say, yeah, the state, I mean, you probably see more failures than successes of industrial policy. The state has, the state will, the state will always fail. But then I would say, but without state intervention, failure is a guarantee. So you need the state. Uh, I mean, this is probably a place as good as... <laughs> a good, as no, not, not, <laughs> it's a safe place. No, I, I, I was not going to say this is probably a safe place for me to endorse the state, but I was going to say this is a place where people really study this symbiosis between state and market and how both these spheres can support each other and one can't actually exist without the other. I mean, the market certainly doesn't exist without the state if you read Polanyi and so on. So on that, I think I am clear that, you know, st state plays an integral role in, in, in economic development. Um, value capture creation, um, well, you know, but I, I like Ben Selwyn's work. Uh, I kind of I, I like his his the way he sort of terms global value chains. He says the global poverty chains. You know, I, I would still say though, and may, maybe I misunderstood your question that, you know, by and large, those firms and those countries that manage to really go up to the high value added aspects of global value chains, also tend to struggle less with the issues of being stuck. In, with global poverty chains. I still think when we talk about activities like R&D, based on my uh, reading of the empirical evidence, you know that, okay, you can talk about, say, China has managed to capture some R&D segments and some important global value chains, but you still have the high-income countries dominating these segments of global value chains. And I should also say as a clarification that you know, I also view some of these pre-production services as incredibly important when you talk about industrial policy, right? Because who does research and development and industrial design? It's engineers, it's people involved in production. And a lot of, I know a lot of people talk about these as intangibles. I, I think it makes sense to talk about this as spheres that have to do with production and manufacturing related activities. Um, and then before I hand over the mic again to someone else on the panel who wants to comment, or the audience, does tilting, does, does leveling the playing field mean giving more policy space to countries in the global south? Yes, for sure. I'm not going to say more than that. I agree. Um, there were three more questions online. Um, one was also on the smile curve, where Amir J was asking, why do some parts of the production process capture more value than others? Is it because more powerful countries are able to control the means of production? Eric Batella also asked, so to explain relations north to south, actually, do you mean nowadays we are, in a certain sense, in a situation similar to that of the 17th century called the putting out system? And then Rosanna Jackson asked, how can we action some of the recommendations in the book do you feel policy makers or decision makers are aware of the Green Industrial Policy 2.0 or do they need convincing? And I might uh, add to that myself, I think if I remember correctly from the work you did with Ha Jun Chang for the Structural Transformation for Africa, 
in 2016, I think you argued, yes, policy space is decreasing, but there's still sufficient policy space for developing countries to mm. operate in. Um, I was wondering, so if doing the research for the book, have you found that policy space has decreased or maybe because of this issue of sort of green industrial policy actually increased a bit? We are certainly running out of time, but I will pass the mic for one final question and then I will give you like two minutes if you can make it Justin to answer. Thank you so much and many congratulations on the book, Justin. I must say that the conversation was great and uh, it made it very enticing for me to actually read the book. Um, so I want to ask you a question about uh, what it means to take a global south perspective on the, question, on the big question of industrialization. You've already mentioned the need to be more nuanced when we use the categories of global south and global north towards the end of the talk, but I would like to push this point uh, a little bit more because I I have a sense that when we talk about a global south, we end up talking about a handful of countries, South Africa, Brazil, India, and a few others. And I wonder whether instead, if we think about the majority of global south countries, so whether the story that you're putting forward holds for them, whether they have actually the opportunity to use industrial policy in certain ways. Um, yeah, so if you could maybe add a few reflections on that, that would be great. Thank you. A lot of great questions. Um, let's start with that, Sarah's really nice question. Um, when I, you know, let's, okay, can, can all countries in the world um, do what China has done in terms of using state-owned enterprises successfully to industrialize, to develop their economies? No. Of course not. Um, so I definitely, you know, when I give this list of policy recommendations for things that countries in the so, in the so-called global south can do, this is not saying that everyone should necessarily follow that recipe uh, for success. I'm also very careful about specifically talking about uh, you know prescribing certain instruments to certain countries without being very knowledgeable about that because for this kind of book and for this kind of presentation, uh, that job should be done uh, by someone who's really um, knowledgeable about the context. Um, and at the same time, I think I also, um, you know, I think it's important not to take a overly pessimistic view on saying that, you know, big, large countries can, you know, compete against multinational corporations, but small countries cannot. Sure, you see a trend there, but then you also see some countries, you know, defying what they've been told they can or cannot do. Um, I think, you know, there weren't many people who thought that Korea would develop as rapidly as it did starting in the 1950s and 60s. There weren't many people that thought that POSCO, you know, today one of the five largest steel companies in the world was going to succeed that much. Um, I also think it's, uh, well... I would love to have a discussion on using this term global south rather than developing, developed, etc. And I know you're more knowledgeable than I am about that. Um, but in the interest of time, I think maybe I should move on to the next question. Um, is there more or less uh, policy space today? I think this is an interesting question, because uh, especially now, because uh, a few days ago there was a paper published in the Review of International Political Economy, a really important paper arguing that policy space has returned for developing countries. Why does this paper argue that? Well, because apparently the US has tried to increase its own policy space and blocked an important legislation mechanism within the WTO that's had the adverse effect of increasing also policy space to developing countries. Um, there's long been this, not long, but for some time now, this argument, actually, the WTO doesn't work anymore. Um, it's not relevant for policy space. When it comes to agreements on goods and services, I would say there is actually, yes, a lot of policy space now 
for developing countries. When it comes to transfer of technology and protection of intellectual property, I still think the WTO plays a very ro important role. You know, you all know when we saw this last play out on a big global scale, the pandemic, right? on vaccine patents. The WTO played a major role in, tra in preventing the transfer of technology to the, the global south. Um, so I do think there is something to be said about the lack of some policy space under WTO law, but there's still, and this is a very important point, still bilateral and regional trade agreements between countries in the global north and countries in the global south um, that are detrimental to countries in the global south. And the point I was making in that report was, generally, you see that international trade agreements in developing countries are beneficial, more, tend to be more beneficial when it's south-south trade agreements, when trade agreements are between countries of similar levels of income. And it's really nice to see that many, many such trade agreements are emerging, and I think south-south agreements is something that we should encourage. And on the point uh, by Rosanna online, how can we action some of the recommendations in the book? I think some are quite specific, especially on global governance and how we can think about reforming global governance. Now, some are maybe a bit more ambitious, especially when it comes to the climate. But when you start thinking, thinking about some of these policies on climate that I suggest, uh, some aren't actually that super ambitious. For example, this idea of more community rather than individual-centered living. A lot of countries in the world have started adopted policies along those lines. Okay, Think about making, uh, I think Oslo, Milan, London has adopted policies to try and disincentivize the use of cars in city centers. Right Now this is on a small scale, it just needs to happen on a larger scale. What about taxing wasteful consumption habits by the rich? Canada's government has recently implemented policies to increase taxes on the purchase of super yachts and private jets. These are things that we really don't need, right, from a use perspective. So you see uh, in, 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 in practice that some of these policies to make us living, live in line more with planetary boundaries are actually being enacted. It's not as utopian as people say. Um, okay. So, uh, really, we couldn't have asked for for a better kick off of our research seminar. I think the conversation really put the bar very high for for the next discussions. And thanks a lot for being here. Also, those of you that are online, and a special thanks to the discussion, and particularly to Yosein for your time and, and all. And, and again, hope you all uh, keep on engaging and joining us in the next uh, sessions of this research seminar.